start recording. Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, no engines, no libraries here, although we did do our one and only library stream yesterday for the asset processor because uh, some people wanted to see how to use SDB true type, so I showed how to use that. Uh, so if you are interested in the one and only time on Handmade Hero that we will probably ever use a library, that was the day to do it. Uh, so what are we going to do today? Today I'm going to show you how to do the same thing uh, without a library. Just because why not? Maybe it will make you appreciate STB true type even more. Uh, so let's take a look. Today is day 164. Uh, so if you want to keep up, if you want to uh, do, do, if you want to code along with me on the stream, if you will, then you're going to want to unpack day 163 source code because that is the source code that I'm going to be starting with here. Uh, and so if you pre-ordered the game on handmadehero.org, unzip day 163, uh, and you will be right in line. You'll be right in line with me. So let's take a look here. Um, like I said, don't allow any libraries in Handmade Hero, but in the asset processor, I'm okay with it. Uh, because that's not something that ships on the end user's machine, so it's okay. Uh, we can do that. So if you want to use this, you can use this right here, STB true type implementation, STB true type. If you want to do that, don't have a problem with it. Go for it. Go, for it. Go nuts. Um, and, uh, and use all the libraries you want in your asset processor. And, uh, you know, I guess what I would say is, even though it's in sort of this offline asset processor, like one of the reasons I don't like using libraries, is I like to be able to keep my code running, I like to keep it portable, and I like to do all sorts of things, uh, efficiency, blah, 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 right? There's all these good reasons not to use libraries um, for me in, in the game. Uh, and some of those are lessened when you talk about the asset processor, because really the asset processor doesn't have to run on a variety of machines. It doesn't have to run 64-bit, 32-bit. Uh, it doesn't have to be portable, right? It, all these sorts of things that doesn't necessarily have to do, because the asset processor just runs on your machine to process the art assets before shipping the game, and then you're done, right? But even so, uh, if you think about it, you know, if you want that asset processor to be something that's like a tool that you rely on and that, you know, maybe you can work on no matter what platform you're working on at that time or whatever, sometimes it makes sense to apply the same sorts of, of rules to your asset processor uh, as you would apply to, to the game. And so I actually tend to, even if I'm in an asset processor, if I'm going to use a library, I still tend uh, to only really allow libraries that would be like SDB true type where they were well engineered. Uh, by a programmer who knew what they were doing and they're really convenient to, to implement and work cross-platform and all these other things uh, don't require a build process blah 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 just because the asset processor eventually does become a fairly uh, sort of heavyweight thing especially if you extend your game to 3d eventually or things like this um, the asset processor can be a fairly serious endeavor and so you know uh, as much as on handmade hero i've decided that the asset processor is kind of the separate thing that we're not really going to be too concerned about um, you know, in a, in a real game project, it can be a fairly formidable beast uh, and sort of, you know, you got to kind of think along those lines. So I'll just say that first, um, something to think about. Uh, but what I wanted to show today was if you didn't want to use a library, right? Because on Handmade Hero, we don't use any libraries in the main code base. Uh, if we didn't want to use a library, how would you have gone about extracting these fonts? Would you have to written your own true type font extractor? That's one thing you could do. The other thing you can do, and I'm not necessarily saying it's better, um, in fact, it's probably worse than choosing SDB true type. But I'm just going to say, what you can do is you can rely on the operating system to get this information because every operating system, no matter what operating you run on, uh, you're going to have a way to extract fonts out of that operating system. So another thing that you could do uh, with the asset processor is get the fonts uh, from Windows, right? And so how do you do that, right? Well, in Windows, uh, Windows actually has a bunch of uh, calls for drawing fonts, right? Uh, for example, this is the text out function. Uh, the text out function is something that can take any string and rasterize it into an HTC. Now, we worked with HTCs in Handmade Hero before. You've seen those back uh, in the early days when we first set up our window and wanted to blip uh, our, you know, our uh, drawing to it. It stands for handle to a device context. A device context is what they called sort of the 
the uh, context for drawing, the context for doing uh, graphics work in the graphics device interface for Windows. And so what we do know is if we wanted to start extracting fonts out of Windows, we could just call this text out function and we know that we could get it to draw to an HDC. So the question is just, could we figure out a way uh, to get one of these HDCs to draw into a bitmap of our choosing, right? Like a bitmap that we uh, are okay with uh, looking at behind sort of the back of Windows, if you will, right? Uh, because if we could do that, we can just have Windows draw the fonts and then we can grab the fonts out of there. And this is the same principle you can follow in just about any operating system. Whatever the thing is they have uh, that would draw fonts, we could just go ahead and, and use that thing, right? Okay. So there's actually a couple of ways we could do this. Uh, we could start by doing the absolute slowest way. Uh, I believe it's called get pixel. Uh, the absolute slowest way, uh, and probably not a particularly good way to go, but we could try it just to make the, the sort of, um, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, the, the, absolute, the absolute slowest but absolute simplest way uh, would be this way, which would be that if we didn't want to try and figure out how to create any kind of a special HDC at all, we could just use a any old HDC, right? Like no matter any HDC we could create, so we just look at how we create a, any old HDC, use that. And then we can call get pixel sequentially to literally read out each pixel in order. And since this is the asset processor, we could just be fine with that. We could just be like, you know what? We don't care if it takes a long time. We're only gonna do it once to extract a font and it's fine, right? So we could do that. Uh, that's not entirely out of the question, right? So maybe let's start with that. And then we can see after we're done with that, if we want to push it a little further and be a little bit more fancy about how we do our HDC. Uh, so if we, have, if we have to get one of these HDCs, uh, the way that we would want to do that um, is by using a, uh, a create DC call. Usually the way that you would probably do that is calling create compatible DC. Uh, and we would just use a DC that was one that we knew about, like one that was, um, you know, maybe one that was, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, like uh, uh, the, the screen, like the screen that, that we're running on, for example, something like this. Uh, but there's a lot of ways that we can do that, right? So you can take a look in here and you can see these. Uh, we can do a create DC call, uh, just raw here, right? Uh, and you can, you can pass sort of all the different things uh, and, and sort of spec out more explicitly what you wanna do, right? Uh, but that just, again, seems like a lot of work because if you do create compatible DC, as long as you know that you have a DC that roughly fits uh, the kind of device context that you want, uh, we could just use that, right? Another thing we could do is we could also create a window and use HDC, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's lots of different things uh, that we could do there, right? Um, and uh, I'm assuming, I can't quite remember, it's been a long time, uh, but I'm assuming uh, that we would have to have a bitmap. Yeah, and it says right here, before an application can use a memory DC for drawing operations, it must select a bitmap uh, of the correct width and height into the DC to select a bitmap into a DC, use the create compatible bitmap function, specifying the height, width, and color organization required. So we kind of know what we would be doing. We'd be creating compatible DC. We'd then be creating a compatible bitmap uh, with that DC, and we would be putting it into uh, the HDC, right? Uh, and that's that's what we would do. So let's take a look. Let's just do that. Um, let's create a pound define here, which is like use fonts from Windows or something like that. And we will define that to be one. Uh, we will then come in here and say, if use fonts for Windows, pound include windows.h, right? Uh, otherwise, we will use stb tree type. And so this way you can choose whether you want to use the library or not, just kind of an example of what's happening there. And then the STB true type part of things, uh, we will sort of make a, a, a version of load glyph bitmap that does not uh, need, uh, that does not need um, STB true type, right? Uh, so basically we'll say, okay, if use fonts from Windows, we're gonna use the Windows path. Um, otherwise, we're gonna use this path here. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay. Uh, so if we're going to do this, like I said before, we want to start with the text out function. This is the function that we would want to call. 
right? Uh, and this function, we would want to um, have that, that DC. So this would be our, our device context, right? Uh, and we would want to presumably just draw into the top of the bitmaps. We don't really need any offsets uh, for the text, right? Uh, and then when we do the code point, unfortunately, we kind of have a nasty issue here, which is that uh, Windows always wants uh, code points, always wants UTF-16. Uh, so we can just cold cast it, I guess, but that's probably not really the quite correct thing to do. Um, like technically, if you wanted to convert to like a WCARE t, uh, t right? Uh, if you want to convert to a UTF-16 character, you kind of need to do a UTF-32 code point to UTF-16 conversion. Uh, so we'll call this a cheese point uh, because it's not really correct, I don't think. Um, but it'll be correct for any of the ANSI characters that we were doing. Uh, and probably a lot of the characters, but you know, like I said, not really correct. Uh, so if we did it that way, um, first, just to get things started, uh, then what we would do is say, okay, pass the cheese point. This is obviously going to be text out W, right? Uh, so we'd pass the cheese point, um, and we would say it's a one character string. That would draw uh, the text uh, like so, and uh, presumably we can actually compile that, uh, but the problem, of course, will be that we don't have a device context yet. Okay. Uh, so we got to get a device context. Here's our device context. We want to create compatible DC, right? Um, and I assume that the easiest way to do it would be to do a create compatible DC zero. Um, at least that's my assumption. Create compatible DC zero, I believe, is the easiest way to say like just copy the um, just copy the screen DC. I don't know if we need to do a get DC zero. I don't think we do, uh, but then again, I'm not sure. So I'm going to try that first. Again, with Windows, it's easy to forget this stuff. Uh, I often forget this stuff. Uh, but then we want to create compatible bitmap as well, uh, and we want to select that in. Again, like I, I don't know if you remember way back when we did Windows stuff, uh, these device contexts, you select objects into them, and those are the objects that you uh, are going to use. So for example, you, a font you would select into the thing. It's kind of like saying, set the active one. So this is like set the active bitmap, set the active font, set the active pen, set the active brush, blah, 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 right? That's how it works. Uh, so let's take a look at create compatible bitmap here. Uh, this one, we're just going to use the HDC uh, that we've already created. Um, and we're going to say what the width and height is. Since we know that we have a certain size uh, size that we're doing, let's just create something large enough that we know uh, that we'll always pretty much fill, uh, we'll always have plenty of room for any character we're going to make. Right? And that will return to us an H bitmap. Right, so here's our bitmap. We go ahead and grab that. We select the bitmap in. Now, we of course want to be able to make sure that we only do this once, right? I mean, we don't want to be doing this all the time. Uh, so really, I think probably what we want to be doing is is you know something like this. Uh, I don't know what device context actually returns if it fails. Uh, I assume that. Um, let's take a look here. Uh, create compatible DC. If we're going to the value, is the handle of if it is just null. Okay. Uh, so basically, we can do device context zero, uh, and we could make that a static. Again, we're in the asset processor here, so anything goes. We don't have to worry at all about that sort of stuff. Uh, so if the device context is not initialized, we will just initialize it, right? Uh, we'll create it like so. Uh, we'll create a bitmap with that. We will select the bitmap into our device context like so, uh, and then we can draw our text, right? Uh, so that should do it. Um, of course, I need to actually close that block. There we go. Uh, and now we're actually, you know, we're in some sense we're sort of now extracting a font, uh, but we're not extracting the right font even because we have not actually tried to set the font to be Arial. Right was the font we were using before. We didn't even do that. <clears throat> Right, uh, and we also don't know. Uh, right, we don't even know how big that font should be. We've got we got all kinds of weird stuff going on here, right? Um, so this is this is really a zygote of a thing. It is not really uh, fully happening, uh, and of course we have not yet actually tried to extract anything either. So we've got a bunch more work to do here, uh, to say the least. So let's start by going. All right, um, we've got a couple things we got to know. First of all, right, and you remember how easy it was with Sean's thing, right? Sean's thing was like this and that, right? That was it. It was like two things, two calls, and we had the whole thing, right? We could just extract everything we wanted, 
all this code is just our code to like basically you know turn his bitmap into our format that was it uh, not not gonna be true for Windows right Windows uh, pretty tortured API even back then uh, it's only gotten worse uh, but it's pretty tortured so what we need to do now is we need to do kind of all the accoutrement um, first of all we got to figure out how much space did that text take up right um, because Sean told us right he said here's the width here's the height uh, but when we draw a text in in Windows it never it, we have no idea right we have no idea how big it is so if we want to do that uh, what we have to do is we have to get some information about it. It doesn't look like they showed it in the related here, uh, but there is a font and text function called get text metrics. Um, and there's also one called uh, get font. Well, I'm sure I'll see one in here. I'm not remembering it right off, uh, off the bat, but there's, uh, there's basically functions that will, we can query sort of, if you will, what the sizes of, of strings are and that sort of thing. Um, so let's see, get text metrics tells us some of the stuff about the font uh, that's like how tall it is and stuff like that. So we probably will need that at some point. Uh, so I'm going to just grab that and put that in there because we're going to have to call that uh, once we get to the part in fonts where we're actually trying to do like alignment for the fonts and that sort of thing, right? Uh, so we got get text metrics, that's going to have to happen, device context, uh, and that like takes one of these LP text metric things, right? Um, we're going to want to get that out. So we've got text metric. Uh, we will ask it to return us a filled out structure for the text metrics. Um, and eventually we'll kind of use, we'll use that for something. Okay, uh, so in here, what else we got? Uh, we don't care about that. We probably want uh, get text extent point 32. That does sound like uh, the function I was thinking of. So let's take a look. Computes the width and height of the specified string of text. That's exactly what we wanted, so we're going to need that guy, right? Uh, and what this will do is when we do our text out, oops, uh, when we do our text out, we want to know how big it's going to be. Uh, so we can just say, okay, get text extent point 32. Here's the device context. Here's our cheese point. Here's the length of our cheese point. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to have to actually get. Uh, that uh, that size parameter, right? And that's one of these guys, right? Hello? Hello, I would like to show the people on the stream the size parameter, please. Thank you. Um, so this is one of those, and all it is is a structure that has basically width and height in it. That's all it is, right? Uh, so it's that. Uh, we would just say, fill that out, please. And that would give us the width uh, and the height, right? So we could basically say, okay, uh, the width is size.cx, uh, the height is size.cy, uh, have a party, it's all good, right? So now at least we would know the region that the text occupied after we did our text out, so we know kind of what region we want to grab, right? Uh, so we can start to do the extraction of the font, okay? Uh, so that gives us all the information we need for that, uh, but we have a few more things we kind of need to do here. Uh, obviously, we're using the same device context here, so one thing we're going to have to do is clear, right, that region first, right? Because if we're going to draw the fonts into it, if load glyph bitmap will be called for every code point, we want to draw the font, right, into a clean bitmap. So we want to be able to clear the background to like black or something, right? And then draw a white bitmap on top of it so that we can see what the actual values are going to be and not have the font, the glyphs like pile up on top of each other. So we need some way of clearing this, right? Uh, and I think we've gone over this a long time ago on the Windows stream. Fill rect is the way in Windows uh, that you can sort of just uh, clear something out. There's, uh, you know, that gives you a rectangle and you can fill it. There's also another one which is called Paplet, right? Um, which is a little bit faster and doesn't use a brush, right? Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and use Paplet, um, and you know I, I shouldn't even say it's a little bit faster. It doesn't use a brush. It's not a little bit faster anymore. In the old days, it would have been. Nowadays, this is all slow because if you want something fast, you have to go through Direct3D or something, right? Um, so you know when I say that, that's kind of me offhandedly talking about 1992. Uh, so anyway, if we go ahead here and and we want to do our clear, we know 
the device context for clearing, obviously it's the one we're drawing our fonts into. We know the left and the right are zero, zero, because we're not positioning anything. We know the width and the height uh, because we just did it. And so all we need to know is how do we set this thing to black, right? How do we get a black in there? And we've got DW uh, ROP, uh, that's the raster op. Blackness happens to be one of them. We can literally just say we want you to fill the area with black. That's one of the raster operations it knows how to do by default. So we can just full on clear the thing that way. Uh, and now we're just going to write in every time, right? And that's all good. Uh, that is all good. However, uh, we've still got more nonsense coming uh, because when we paplet the blackness in there, remember when we do the text out, uh, we haven't said what color the text should be. And so the text could very easily come out black because I think the default for text may even be black. So we'd end up with black text on a black background. That will not help us extract this font uh, in any way. So we need to do something to change that font color. And uh, wouldn't you know it, it's actually called set text color, a fairly reasonably named function. Set text color. Uh, allows us to say what we want our text color to be. So we can say to set text color of the device context. We can set that color uh, to a color ref, which is just white. And uh, Windows actually has a thing for that, which is it's RGB. Uh, it's a little macro, which you can just say RGB, 225, 225, 225, right? That's one way of quickly specifying one of those color ref structures, uh, which is just a way of saying I want, you know, FF, FF, FF to be what you write in all the pixels where the text is. Okay, uh, so that will write white text on top of a black backdrop, which means we could now, if we wanted to, try doing some extraction. That code is going to look exactly the same uh, as it did in the case with Sean's, right? We are going to want to allocate some memory, do the, the little dance of fun, right? We're going to want to extract stuff, but instead of extracting it from a mono bitmap this time, uh, since we're going to be tr doing the slow path here, the get pixel path, uh, what we need to do is actually replace this call where we get the alpha. Uh, we, what we need to do is replace that with uh, the get pixel call that I was talking about before, where we ask the device context what the pixel is at a particular location. So we go in there and say, okay, get pixel. Here it is. Um, you know, taking a look at it, it needs the HTC, the X and the Y pose, right? And we've got those. We know we're extracting this X and Y, right? Uh, and uh, yeah. And so that's all pretty much good, right? Everything's fine. Um, we may, I don't remember whether this will come in upside down or right side up. Uh, so we don't know whether we want to keep the flipping that we were doing in Sean's path. Because um, I don't remember what it will do by default, uh, what the X and Y coordinates are, whether they'll start in the bottom left or the top right. It's been way too long. Uh, so I don't know. But point being, that get pixel call will return us a color ref structure. Uh, and so we're going to get back a color ref. Uh, this is the pixel. And so what we can do there is take a look at that. It's a D word, right? And since we're writing white in there and we know it's B, B, G, G, R, R, we can take any one of these three and treat that as the alpha because they're all going to be the same, B, B, G, G, R, R. So we can literally, uh, for our U8 alpha, we can just take the pixel. Uh, we can end it with O, X, F, F. That extracts the red channel, cast it to a U8, and that is all she wrote, right? So that's all good. Um, what is the problem? Cannot convert, ah, uh, right, that's probably a W function. Yes, it is. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at what we've got now. Um, I think that's roughly the outline of something that extracts a font. We are not setting the font yet, so we're not gonna get Arial. Um, but that is roughly uh, modulo bugs what we would roughly have to do. Create a compatible DC, select a compatible bitmap into that. Uh, this is kind of waiting around for later. Figure out how big it's gonna be, clear it, draw it in white, uh, extract each by pixel by pixel. Uh, and again, this is a very slow way to do it because we're not reading memory, we're making an operating system call every time to get that pixel, so super slow. Um, but, you know, will should in theory work. Uh, pack it back up as usual, and that is the end uh, of, of the party, right? Uh, so that's basically everything. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and test that out. Uh, we'll see if that works at all. Remember, using the current stuff that we've got, using uh, stblib for our font extraction, 
uh, this is what things should look like, right? It's it's sort of uh, sprays nothings all over the place. And so if we wanted to uh, test this, we should be able to rebuild the asset uh, library, right? Uh, by going build uh, test asset builder, right? That should rewrite all of our asset files. We can look and see that we have rewrited them for today, which is the 5th of August, right? Uh, and now we can uh, run and see if we did anything at all, right? Uh, which we don't know if we did or not, right? We have no idea. Uh, where is our MS dev? There it is, right? Um, so there we go. Not great. You can see that it's just solid, which is not at all what we want to see, right? Um, but it doesn't look totally wrong in the sense that the sizes seem right. So we're not, you know, we're not catastrophically bad. We're just not good, right? So now we get to try and figure out what went wrong. Um, and uh, maybe that first involves me taking another drink of my lemonade. Like so. Okay, so what exactly could be the culprits here? It seems to me like it's, you know, it's pretty clear from looking at that, uh, that the alpha is always, we're, we're always getting white, right? We're always getting back 255, uh, which is not what we want to see. So even though when we call get text extent 0.32w, it looks like it's returning us the correct size for the character, uh, for some reason our either our patblit to blackness is not working, right? Uh, or our set text color uh, is not setting it to white or something like this, right? Um, well, no, that can't be it because it pretty much has to be this guy because you know, if we were to take a look at doing nothing, right? I know who's at fault here. I know exactly who's at fault here. I'm going to run a little test. I'm going to run a little test. What if we set the text color to black? Hmm? What if? What do you guys think would happen if I set the text color to black? I'm gonna run a little test for y'all. Well, surprise, surprise, all the letters show up and they're inverse video. What happened here? Well, I'll tell you what happened here. That's one of those, hey, I've been programming Windows so long, I even remember all the bugs I used to have and this is one of them that you always have because you would not think that this would be the default, but it is the default. When you draw text in Windows, uh, there is like a set text BK mode or set BK mode nonsense, this function, right? Uh, this function determines whether or not drawing actually leaves the background uh, in its original state or whether it will fill it with the background brush when it draws, right? So what we can do, we have two choices. We can set BK mode uh, to be transparent and then this would work fine. Uh, but what was basically happening there, right, was it was drawing the font in, in white, but filling the whole region around the font in white as well, because that's what it's expected to do, right? It's, it's obliterating the background behind it, which was black. So we could select in a black brush as the background color, right? And that would fix it as well. That seems a little cleverer, because then we can get rid of Patblit. Right? We could turn off Patblit, select in a background brush, right? Um, and that seems kind of uh, seems kind of creative, right? It seems kind of creative. Rather than setting the mode uh, to transparent, uh, we could just do it that way, right? I feel like that's uh, uh, I feel like that's uh, you know a possibility. I'm just gonna I don't even remember how to do background brushes. I'm just gonna search and see. Uh, let's see, Windows set background brush. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look. Doopity doo. The system based background for window. Or is, I don't care about any of this. I don't. I want. I don't want the window. I don't want the window background. I want. I want the device. I want the HDC. I want the DCs. Background. Background color. Uh, set DC brush color. 
How about that? Set DC brush color. Set DC brush color. Let's see. Set DC brush color function sets the device uh, current device context DC brush color to the specified color value. If the device cannot represent the specified color value, color is the physical color. Uh, let's see. When the stock DC brush is selected, you see the subsequent drawing we're done with the DC brush color. The default DC brush color is white. That is our problem. We want it to be black. Let's just give this a shot, ladies and gentlemen. Windows GDI. Let, is, let us just see uh, what it does if we full on say the background is now black. All right. Will it work? Will it not work? We don't know. Uh, but off we go. That does not look very reassuring. That is exactly where we were before. I am unimpressed. I am unimpressed by that. Uh, so set DC brush color does not see. Is there a D, is there a background brush color? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the device context reference. This is something that if you programmed Windows GDI, like when I used to program Windows GDI, I would have just known this. So. It's not like it's that hard, uh, but anyway. Set DC brush color, set DC pen color, set layout, release DC, get stock object, get object type, get layout. I don't know here. I'm not sure. This doesn't have set text color in it, which is a little bit weird. Uh, why doesn't it set text color? It's a little bit fishy, wouldn't you say? I would say. Font and text functions. Set, oh, it's right there. Okay. Set PK colors functions the current background color to the specified color value or to the nearest color value, so okay, blah, blah, blah. This function fills the gaps between styled lines drawn using a pen created the create pen function. Does not fill the gaps between styled lines. So you think this is what the font does? If the font bar is opaque, the background color you to fill gaps between style. I bet this is just, it's just using this. So we don't even need the brush. It's just set BK color. Man, oh man. All right, set BK color. Let's try it one more time. There we go. So there we go. Uh, that's how you extract the font with Windows. And again, you can choose kind of how you want to uh, do that on an operating system. There's different operating systems, different operating systems, different ways to do it. Uh, but you can do the same thing in, in other platforms as well. Uh, it's just a, a, a more Byzantine nonsense like what I just went through in a different way. Uh, so anyway, that extracts the fonts from Windows. The problem that we have right now is we are unable to pick the font that we want. And we would like to be able to pick the font that we want, right? Uh, we would like to be able to create uh, a font and render with that font. So uh, there is a way to do that. It is unsurprisingly called create font and also create font indirect. There are different ways of creating fonts. And they are really, really, really annoying. The reason they are annoying is because, you know, and I, I want to say I've never even figured out a way to do this. I, I didn't try, admittedly. I've never tried particularly hard. Uh, but in my recollection, I don't think I ever really knew a way to create a font from just a file on the drive, right? Like just, hey, here's a file name, man. I just want to create a font uh, that's this file name. Never, never figured out a way to do that. Uh, and if you look at the font and text reference, uh, it's, not, um, it's not straightforward how to do that, right? Uh, you've kind of got these things here uh, for creating fonts. I, uh, I don't actually remember, um, you know, it might be add font resource maybe. Is this a new thing? That this, this adds one from a file name, right? Um, so this looks like it. I don't know if that adds it permanently or not. Um, I'm not sure. Any application that adds or removes fonts from the system font table should notify other windows of the change. Um, when an application no longer needs a font resource that is loaded by add font resource, you remove font resource. So yeah, so. I don't think I ever figured out a way to just say, I want to create a font from a file. I don't want it to be loaded into Windows. I just want to draw some text with just that font and then I'm going to be done. Uh, I'm pretty sure the only way you can do something approximating that uh, is by using add font resource, which kind of adds it like to the whole thing, right? Um, 
it, it, it sort of makes it, it like pulls it into Windows as a system rather than just privately to you. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that's the only way you can actually do it. Uh, yeah, people who program GDI more these days might know of a better way, but I don't, I don't think there was a way. Uh, so if we take a look at this guy, it's, it's roughly what we do want though, I think. Uh, and again, this is, this is supported pretty much everywhere at this point, so that's fine. Add font resource EX, that will be the thing that would allow us to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, give it a TTF that it would add into Windows. Uh, and then we could uh, say, for example, private, which is that like, we don't actually want you to share this with anybody. Um, so I'm gonna go that route. I think that's probably the easiest way to go. Uh, this will get the font into Windows. So add font resource EX, right? Uh, we'll pass it that file name. And then we'll pass it uh, that private flag, right? FR private, uh, like so. Uh, and we will pass it uh, the zero there, right? Uh, so that would that would uh, add that font resource. The problem is I don't know um, how I get out the font from that. Like meaning, once we add one, how do I? How does it know uh, which one? Let's see. Maybe font memory source probably uses one from font. Yeah, it does. That's loading from memory. Uh, so if I get back one from add font uh, ex, I'm going to get back an integer here, and it just tells me how many fonts were added. I don't actually know how I actually get those fonts. Uh, the font will not be present. The font listed in the registry and installed to a location other than the window fonts folder cannot be modified, later replaced, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but there's no way to actually use that font, is there? Like there's just no way to actually say, I wanna use, I wanna create font, that font, right? I mean, am I missing it? But I don't, I don't think there is. Uh, so we would also have to know what the font <clears throat> that we were gonna, use was actually called, right? We'd have to know the name. Uh, and so let me double check, add font resource EX example, um, just to see if anyone knows uh, how to do something like that. And it looks like uh, they don't. They just don't know how to do it. So I'm guessing, the internet does not seem to know. Uh, so I'm guessing you just can't do it. Uh, so after you add the font resource, you need an additional piece of information, right? Uh, which is the font name. Now STB doesn't need that. Um, although you might argue that it does need that if you wanted to actually search through a TTF file to s and, and pick a specific font. Uh, but in Windows, we absolutely need that because the only way we can do it is to first add the file name into the font set in Windows, but then we have to pull out that font again, right? We have to have know what the actual face is called, not the file name, uh, to tell it uh, which font we're creating here, right? Uh, so if we were to do create font, uh, now at this point to make one of these fonts, right, we have to uh, specify all this nonsense, uh, and then at the end, this is the part uh, that's actually the business end there, uh, the LPC to, uh, LPC tster part. Uh, that's the part where we would pass the font name uh, in to the system, right? So now we've got to fill out all this stuff, uh, but that's just kind of a grind through the docs, nothing particularly weird happening. Height, uh, if you set, set a negative value, this is just a little convention here, greater than zero, uh, I believe it's a, a match. Um, Yeah, so if you use zero, it uses the default. If you use greater than zero, it transforms it into device units and matches it against the cell height available fonts. If you use it less than zero, it transforms value to device units and matches, <clears throat> matches its absolute value against character height. So I guess it's like kind of saying, hey, if, I, if the thing was upside down or something like that, I don't even know, I'm not even sure uh, what even that's trying to say. Let's see here. For the MM text mapping mode, you can use the flying format to specify a height for a font with a specified point size. Um, I don't really care about that. I actually want it to just use uh, pixels. Uh, the character rate file also knows the EM height is the character cell height value minus the internal leading value. The font mapper interprets the value in the following manner. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll have to play with that a little bit. I feel like we may have to do a transformation to get out to actually figure out what value we want to pass here to get the right pixel size. 
Uh, yeah, because we don't want points, we want pixels. Anyway, uh, no big deal. Uh, we'll figure out the height in a second. Height, we'll just say for now is, is I don't even remember what we were specifying in, in Sean's one, uh, 128 or something like that. Is that correct? 128, yeah. Uh, so, I don't know, we'll just say it's 128 for now, but we'll do a to-do. Okay, so you figure out how to specify pixels properly here. Um, so in the height, we'll just say height. Uh, the width of the font, we don't actually care uh, because we don't want to specify any kind of stretching or anything like that. Uh, the escapement in fonts is just a sort of way of saying how rotated you want a font to be. Like if you're trying to do text on an angle, um, we don't really want any of that, right? Uh, we want it to be to be zero, which is the it's the angle between the x-axis uh, and the angle of the font. So we want it to just run straight across the x-axis. So that's uh, zero, if that makes sense. Uh, so anyway, uh, same is true. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, same is true of the. Uh, orientation, which is saying how the letters are spun. The escapement's like the, the, escapement's like the um, uh, running of the actual text, right? Uh, but then the letters themselves can, can be sort of rotated uh, similarly. Uh, so we don't want the letters rotated either, because we can always rotate them ourselves in the game, right? So we just want them upright standard. Uh, for the FN weight, uh, I think we don't care. We probably want normal, I would say, uh, if we had a choice. That would be my guess. So let's just do normal. Uh, for italic, uh, we don't want italics, right? Maybe I'll label these. This is italic. Uh, this is weight, right? Uh, this is underline. This is strikeout. Whoever uses strikeout, man, it's so weird. Uh, okay, so character set. Um, I don't know what we want for character set. Uh, probably we could just use ANSI at, at this point. Um, although if we're using Unicode code points, uh, you would think that we would be able to say, you know, uh, that we wanted that. I suppose it probably doesn't matter because the character set's probably only used if you use the ASCII function calls. That's my guess. Uh, so I don't think it matters uh, because we're actually using the Unicode versions uh, when we do text out. Uh, so I, I feel like that's probably fine. All right, so output precision, how closely the output must match the requested font's height with character orientation statement. Uh, I don't know that we care too much about that, uh, honestly. Uh, so we can just probably do default uh, because again, I don't think we necessarily care. Uh, clip precision, I think probably also similarly we don't care. Uh, these are all things if we were actually using this to render our fonts like in lots of circumstances and all that sort of stuff. But uh, we probably want anti-aliasing on, right? Um, we don't want clear text, I would say, uh, would be my guess. So we probably want, because clear text is going to introduce that sort of thing that's you know only appropriate for a specific LCD panel kind of a thing. Uh, and then pitch family, uh, I think we probably want uh, don't care, I would guess. Uh, let's see, the pitch and family of the font. To the to specify the pitch of the font, it could be one of the flies. Default pitch, fixed pitch, variable pitch. Um, so we could just do default pitch, like so. Default pitch. And uh, the file for higher bits, specify the font family, it could be one of the following values. Uh, decorative, don't care. Probably don't care, would be my guess. So there we go. Uh, that would create our font, provided that we actually had a font name, right? Uh, and uh, I think that's basically it. We would just need to say uh, what the source font name actually was, which adds a little complexity uh, to our thing here, right? Which is font name, it's this additional thing uh, down at the bottom. Again, it's really annoying, uh, but that's just what happens uh, when you're dealing with something that's not as good as SDD, SDB true type. So, if we go back to the point where we do our Arial here, and we say, okay, I added Arial to TVF, I want you to find the font Arial, unsurprisingly, right? Then we need our add character asset function to have font file uh, and face name or whatever, right? Um, or font name, I should say, right? And so then in here, when we set that, 
uh, we'll set set the code point. We also set uh, the font name to be font name. And that's uh, really it. So that's all we need to do to actually create the fonts in theory. Uh, but just creating the font actually isn't enough uh, because we are not actually using that font, right? We're creating a font handle, but we have not told this, D, this DC uh, to use it, but we can do that the same way we did with the bitmap by just selecting that as an object, uh, selecting that object into the DC. It's saying, make this font the active font. Uh, and that may be everything. Uh, famous last words, uh, we'll see. Um, there we go. And that looks, that looks a lot more aerial to me, um, I think. It's hard to say. Um, You know, maybe we should set it to something a little more recognizable, like courier. You know what I'm saying? So if, for example, we were to say, you know what, don't use that. Use courier new. Uh, and uh, I guess I don't know, Dirty Windows, fonts, uh, courier, core.ttf maybe? Maybe Courier New. So we should be able to see something significantly uh, different here, right? If we run the asset processor now uh, and look at the output of its fonts, right? Yeah, so that's definitely working. It's just, I feel like the fonts are kind of thin and anemic to some degree. Uh, and I don't know if that's just because we're generating them too large or generating them too small. So we, we definitely have, uh, you know, some some uh, questions there. Because let's 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 do something else here, right? Let's also switch it back uh, to using the STB fonts, right? Let's let's try that uh, and see how that goes. Uh, we'll run the asset build and then run the game again. So you see, it's just so much nicer. Uh, in the SDB library, just so much nicer there. Uh, and so I think there's a couple reasons for that. One is I think that we're, the SDB library is actually getting just the text rectangle, right? Um, I think, I think when we ask for the text extent point of that letter, I think it's giving us back more than just the pixels. So. So Sean's library is actually doing a better job of, of giving us back the rectangle, I, I would suspect. Uh, we could double check by looking at some of these. Uh, and in, in fact, I guess one way of doing it might be to, to keep sort of the border in there. Like, so for example, uh, what we could do is instead of doing the alpha thing in Test Asset Builder, right? Uh, what we could do is when we build our, when we, when we actually use the alpha here, what we could do is say, ah, you know what? Um, that's not the one I meant in here, I should say. Uh, maybe we do something like, uh, right, we do color uh, and alpha. And normally alpha equals color, but here we'll just set it, you know, to 255 straight up. Um, and so, uh, you know, I guess I'll do gray is probably a better term for that. Uh, like so, um, and now, you know, that way I'm, I'm forcing the alpha to be solid. So now we'll see the actual bitmap. Uh, in all of its glory. Here is, uh, oh, or not. I thought we would have. Um, what did I do wrong there? Alpha is OXFF. That should have been, ah, of course. We've got two of these routines. Yep. Should probably should try to share a little of that source, potentially. You know what I'm saying? Gray. So let's do that. Alpha equals OXFF. And then we'll just say, okay, the rest of it's gray. Gray, gray, gray. Okay. Run the asset builder. Take a look at Sean's. Uh, there we go. And you can kind of see exactly what I was saying. Um, as I suspected, right? Like Sean's is, is perfectly tight bounding box uh, around that letter. There's no empty space there, right? Uh, and I suspect that what we're going to find when we take a look at the Windows one is that is that we're not getting that, right? 
So if I switch back to using fonts extracted from Windows without the STB library, uh, and I go ahead and run test asset builder, right? Uh, then, uh, yeah, you can already see, right? You can see how it's kind of got all this empty space on the top and the bottom and so on, right? Um, so get text extent point is really not, it's not giving us the actual thing we wanted. Um, and I can, for the moment, I can certainly also go into uh, Handmade Hero and force those things to be a little bit bigger, right? Uh, particle, down our particle system here. When we push the bitmap and I set that size, I can make those much larger temporarily, uh, like so. Right, and you can kind of see how much how much empty space there is there. Uh, it's it's pretty tight, left to right, uh, but up and down, it it just plain isn't, you know. Uh, so it makes me think that maybe get text extent point is is not doing the, the vertical spacing, it's only doing the horizontal spacing. Uh, so yeah, I guess what I would say about that is that's a, you know easily fixable by a pre-scan. I don't know if there's an easier way uh, to do it by maybe trying to convince Windows um, not to do that kind of nonsense. Uh, there might be a way with some other text extent thing. Let's quickly check, but then I'll just do a scan and that would solve the problem, right? Text extent point. Let's take a look, ladies and gentlemen, and see what it says. Uh, get text extent point. Hello. No rush here, people. No rush. It's not like we have to go to the Q&A or anything. Oh, come on. There we go. Uh, so let's see, remarks. Remarks. Um, let's see, if I choose such a fun string with my electric computer, blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. The calculated string with takes into account the intercharge spacing. Okay, that's totally fine. The calculated string with we don't, it's not the width is a problem. Um, when this function function returns the text extent, it assumes the text is horizontal. The same is always zero. This is true for both the horizontal and vertical measure of the text. You need to find this in our statement. So it's basically just broken. Um, the graphics mode is set to do GM advanced character is not used, blah, 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 blah. I don't see anything that really talks about uh, sort of that, that other kind of width. Spacing. So I'm just going to scan it, uh, making our slow get pixel loop even slower, uh, but obviously pretty easy to do. All we need to do here is say, you know what, get text extent point, super, super not relevant, don't care at this point. So we can just even full on say, doesn't matter, right? We're not going to do that anymore. Uh, and then we are going to set the width and height uh, this way. Okay, and we need to do a little bit more work there if we do it, uh, so, so we'll see. So, okay, so first of all, oh, you know what though? I, I take it back. We do wanna do that just to bound the region we actually have to search, so that would be good, right? So we'll start with the width and height this way, and what I'll do is I'll say, okay, uh, we've got a min x, right? Uh, min y, and these are gonna be equal to uh, the, the, the total width, so, you know, something like, um, some really huge value, right? Uh, these are gonna be equal to incorrect things, right? Something like that. So as we go through here, when we do our, uh, our loop, whenever I see a pixel, right? If the pixel uh, is not equal to zero, so it's not a black pixel, then I know that this is in bounds, right? Uh, so what I can do here is say, you know, if uh, the Y value you know, is, uh, is less than the min y, or I should say, if the min y is greater than the y value, the min y equals the y value, right? Um, if the min x value is greater than the x value, right? Just this kind of nonsense, uh, something like this, right? Should probably do x first, tend to use x first by convention. 
Uh, and so we'll do if the if the max is less than right, just picking out the maximum values, and that will give me right just by every time I take a look here. Uh, oops, that will give me the specific uh, minimum and maximum x y coordinates uh, of this of this block, right? If that makes sense. Uh, so we don't need to record anything. We actually wouldn't need to record anything if we didn't find any pixels that were set, right? Uh, so what we can do is say if the min x, if min x uh, is greater uh, is less than or equal to max x, uh, then we're good, right? So we found some pixels, and that's all good. Uh, we can then go through and actually do something here, right? Like so. Uh, so if that's the case, then we can go through and do something. We need to figure out our width and height. Uh, our width and height is obviously just going to be um, width equals max x minus min x, uh, height equals max y minus uh, min y. Now, um, it's not quite right, because remember, the max x is the maximum x value that's filled, and the min x is the minimum x value that's filled. So let's say there was just a pixel, uh, the fifth pixel in was set, you would get a 5 for max x and a 5 for min x. Well, the width should not be 0 in that case, it should be 1. Right, uh, so we really want to add one here uh, to get the correct width from that subtraction. Right? Does that make sense? Uh, that's just a little fence posting, or not a fence posting, an off by one kind of thing. Uh, you know, you just got to make sure that you understand width is not max minus min; uh, it's one past max minus min, technically. Okay, uh, so if we do that, uh, now we've got the width and height. Uh, problem, of course is that this is now, uh, this is set wrong, but we've actually computed these so we can really just do it this way now and know that we've got the right ranges because we've kind of computed what our min x uh, and max x and min y and max y are and all that stuff, right? So that should give us what we want uh, to get that bound back in there, you know? Uh, so that's a good thing. I don't know why Destro is in there. Destro should not be in there. Uh, so there we go. Just a quick and dirty little bounds checker. Um, hopefully I programmed it correctly, who knows. Um, there we go, and that does look quite a bit better, right? That does look like now we're getting kind of right uh, up to the edges. It still looks kind of awful. I don't know if you can see that, but there's just a lot of jaggies in there. I don't know why we're not seeing any anti-aliasing um, from Windows. That's kind of weird, right? That's just a little bit odd, and I'm not sure uh, I'm not sure why that's happening. Um, I don't know if that's something we're doing uh, or something we're not doing, you know, that, that we need to, to do uh, better, right? Um, so yeah, uh, so that's all good for the fonts. Of course, there is one more thing that we need to take into account, which is the fact that we actually want a one pixel empty border around everything uh, because that is sort of what's necessary for our, our fill routines, right? And so what we'd like to do here, even maybe perhaps in a, in a, in a sort of forward-looking forward sense, we'd want to insert a border around there, which is something like, you know, okay, we want the min x to actually be one less than it would normally be, right? We want everything to be uh, a little bit uh, wider. Uh, we want to have that one pixel border. So that would give us our, our one pixel border. Uh, and that would pretty much be everything that we would need uh, for our... Uh, for our fonts, right? Uh, and that should just about do it. Uh, I think that's that's pretty good for now. So why the anti-aliasing isn't working, I'm not sure. I don't know if there's something we have to do. Device context anti-aliasing. I'm not sure uh, if there's any kind of specific thing uh, that needs to that needs to happen there. Anti-aliasing, aliasing. No. Uh, Windows. Let's do text out anti-alias, right? Um, I don't know if there's anything in particular that we have to do for that. Uh, I don't actually know. It might be, <laughs> it might be that there's some other thing that we have to set in there. It looks like they're setting the BK mode to transparent. Um, I don't know if that's actually necessary or not, uh, but uh, you know we're not doing that, right? Uh, I don't know if we would need to do a, something where we actually create our own backing bitmap if there's something wrong with our backing bitmap. I don't know. Uh, but that's probably something better left uh, for another time. Now is probably a better time to go to the Q 
uh, and A, right? All right. Uh, so yeah, if you have any questions about what we did today, again, that was just showing how to not use a library to extract fonts. Um, that's all, really. Uh, and uh, I feel like I feel like there shouldn't have been really much mystery there, right? It's just a little bit of it harkens back to the whole Windows API nonsense, which of course is always a little weird, uh, but uh, nothing too too out of the ordinary. Can the fonts have outlines? Um, you mean, you mean like if you wanted to add an outline to the font, that a font that does not normally have an outline? I'm not, I'm not 100% uh, sure what you mean there. What did you mean by backing bitmap? Uh, what I mean by backing bitmap is that. A device context always draws into an actual bitmap, right? Uh, that's, uh, well, I shouldn't say always. A device context uh, has the notion of having a bitmap set in it, uh, and that is the bitmap to which it will draw. That bitmap, uh, in our case, we did not really create one ourselves manually. We just said create some bitmap that would be compatible with this device context, right? And so the backing bitmap just means like the bitmap that's, you know, backing this device context. It's the one, it's this one, right? And what I didn't know is, do we have to create one ourselves with specific parameters in order to get that anti-aliasing, right? That's what I did, that's what I don't know, right? And I, I you know, I really don't know. Um, obviously we can do some experiments to see. Uh, we could do, uh, we could double check to see what happens if we do turn on patblit instead and do set uh, bk mode um, device context transparent right we can try that first uh, and see if that improves if that actually leads to a font actually being anti-aliased uh, or not right the other thing is maybe we're drawing it too big it might be anti-aliased and it's just our down shrinking that makes it not anti-aliased uh, and to do that, and you know what, this would be nice too because it would slow down Handmade Hero. Um, if I were to write, this would slow down our renderer a ton so we could see them more easily. Um, no, those really just don't look anti-aliased at all to me. That doesn't look like it has anything to do with us. That's just full on, that's just full on garbage right there. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, so it doesn't look like it's that BK mode thing. So maybe it is uh, the problem with the backing bitmap. I'm not sure. You know, GDI is a mysterious beast. Uh, it's pretty random most of the time. Uh, so I don't know. So I was thinking that maybe we have to create a, a different kind of backing bitmap uh, to, to make that anti-alias properly. Kuber Caleb, I love how SU Trip is easier and arguably better than the Windows API version. Yeah, it's not surprising, really. Vote on the straw poll. Uh, what is the straw poll? Oh, for the Handmade Heroes domain name. Have you guys been working on a domain name for Handmade Heroes? Is that, uh, is that what's going on? Vote on the straw poll. What are the names that you guys have selected? HandmadeHeroes.org, HandmadeCoders.com, handmadedev.com artists okay you don't want you don't want anything that sort of has the sound anal in it like artisanal software is just a bad idea uh, hmh.website code.crafterscare.org i don't know handmadedev.com handmadecoders.com both sound good i would say maybe like are we sure these are the best ones like should you try? Should we try again for a couple, another round, right? Or is the magic one in here? So I'm not gonna vote. Um, I'm not gonna vote. HandmadeHeroes.com is currently leading. Yeah, I think the problem with that one is people will make get get confused. 
they'll go to handmadehero.org and wonder why they're not seeing the projects they were trying to find is my guess but i could be wrong about that does does have windows font have subscript and superscript support and therefore so much over bounding also is the anti-alias only stored in the alpha value by windows after seeing a pro like you struggle with this api i understand the burden you go through with it having seen scb yesterday yeah so i mean like you know i i got that done relatively quickly because i already knew it all but imagine coming to that as someone who had no idea what was going on you'd go nuts you wouldn't even know what to look for you'd be like you'd never would have known the opaque thing you never would have known half the stuff right the the anti-alias stuff i don't remember i think you know so i i don't even remember what you need to do to do that i have done that before um so it's just like it's it's really it's really pretty rough and this is one of windows better apis like the newer apis like direct 2d for example which they introduced um is 10 times worse w wpf or whatever the thing there's the the other graphics library 10 times worse so this is the best it gets too as you go up in years they get worse and worse Uh, as for superscript and subscript, uh, I don't think they do. I think normally you just draw the font smaller. Do we have the ability? But but it was probably leaving room for descenders and ascenders or stuff like that. It was probably the line height. Like a get get text extent point probably always returns the line height. To clarify, do we have the ability to create font bitmaps with outlines on the characters that could maybe be colored separately? Well, we have the ability to. Uh, we could pretty easily do that if the font had that in it. Um, and, and really all we would need, I guess, you know what? I don't think STB supports that though. Does it? I don't know if STB supports that. Because you know what? I don't think TrueType supports that. To be completely honest with you. I, I don't think TrueType supports that. I think fonts that look like they have outlines in TrueType are actually just, they fill the outline as a shape and the inside's actually hollow. Um, so I think, no, we really can't support that without probably some other font file format. Do you know what I mean? That would, uh, right. But our system, the rest of our system doesn't care. So we could, you know, if Yangshan drew individual font characters for us, they could have outlines because they're just bitmaps in our system. So we can have full color, whatever we want. Right. Uh, but as far as windows is concerned, I don't think they have it. Which one is worse, GDI or Direct Input 8? Probably a toss up, probably Direct Input 8, just because it has calm. Quartertron, is today a good example of why sometimes using a library is okay? Uh, I don't know that today is a good example or a bad example of that. It's more just, um, it's more just using a library is always okay if you know enough about the problem and understand enough about what you're doing to know that the library won't create problems for you, right? Usually the problem with using a library is that people use libraries that they don't understand and then it goes horribly wrong, right? Because they don't know how to maintain that library, they don't know what to do if the library has bugs in it, they don't know how to get the library ported to a different platform, they don't know, uh, you know, even why the library might be slow or fast in certain circumstances, they have no idea, right? And so, Using a library is actually always okay, as long as you know what you are doing, right? Um, so I don't think using a library is a problem. Uh, not knowing what you're doing is the problem. Now, the, the sort of the corollary to that is when you do know what you're doing, you will pretty rapidly find that most libraries aren't worth using. They are worse than doing it yourself. And so one of the reasons that I don't use a lot of libraries is because there really aren't very many libraries that are any good. The STB libraries are definitely a break in that trend. STB libraries are so good that they usually do legitimately save you a considerable amount of time and they don't create huge headaches for you down the line. When you use a less STB library, you are often uh, going to save total time on your project. And that is not true of most libraries. So, you know, if you're talking about an STB library, yeah, uh, a lot of times that ends up being a good choice. Uh, other libraries, oftentimes not so much, but in either case, the important thing is to be competent enough in the domain of the library 
uh, and familiar enough with how the library is constructed and how it works to know that you are not making a mistake. Uh, and so that's what I would say. And on Handmade Hero, the reason we don't use libraries is not because there aren't libraries we could use that would be good, because like I showed you, STB library is good. Uh, the reason we don't use libraries on Handmade Hero is because part of the point of Handmade Hero is to show people how to code all the parts of a game. And if we just use some library to do it, uh, then we wouldn't know that. And so that's why I wanted to restrict the use of libraries to only being in the asset processor, because in the game itself, I wanted to show uh, all of it. Would direct write or clear type help out the, with the anti-aliasing? Uh, the anti-aliasing does work through this path. I've done it before. I think you just need to do a couple other settings. Ignore this if you're already doing this, but why not ship the mono bitmap as part of the asset file instead of the much larger RGB bitmap? Uh, because do we care? Like, do we care about that footprint space, right? Um, that is a space optimization. And it's a space optimization that, that makes our code more complex. Because now every time you load a bitmap, you have to know whether it's a mono bitmap or regular bitmap. And you have to either then add code to our renderer to handle mono, or you have to convert on load, which takes more time and makes your loading code slower. So all of those trade-offs, you would have to go, OK, am I making a good decision here when I add this optimization for mono bitmaps? And I would uh, suggest that since fonts are pretty much the only place we'll probably use them, there may be a couple other, like maybe particle systems, uh, it would just be a really bad idea. More code complexity slower potential load times or more complexity in the renderer uh, for what payoff slightly fault smaller asset file size not feeling it right and plus if we run our code through an lz compressor it would probably eliminate it would shrink it down to a mono bitmap automatically because every entry is going to be five four i mean four replicated values right so the lz compressor would eat that for breakfast Abner Coimbra. People are liking the idea of handmade.dev. Yeah, it sounds kind of cool. Handmade.dev seems pretty rememberable and distinct from the main Handmade Hero org site. Uh, got a good name, got a good ring to it. Handmade.dev. I like it. How often do you regret using an API library and backup writing your own implementation? When you are fast paced as you, maybe this sometimes is better when your knowledge of the problem is sufficient. Um, I basically always write everything myself these days because my experience uh, in my programming career has been that I have always regretted using third party anything. Software, tools, libraries, everything. I pretty much find they're all garbage. Uh, the STB libraries are like one singular shining example of things I have not regretted using, uh, but they are few and far between. Uh, so like, you know, I pretty much regret every third party thing I've ever used uh, right up until today using like Microsoft's compiler. If I had time to write a compiler, I'd replace it, right? Uh, and the debugger, I'd, re like, I'd replace all this. It's, it's just not good enough. Um, I don't like relying on them and they get worse over time is the other thing right like every time i uh go and have to move to a new version for some reason everything breaks and it's weird and they broke something and it's slower and all this stuff right so yeah i i have total i have total nih but it's not like i was born with it like i i got it from having been so disappointed in so many things for so long uh, so now my rule is basically the things that i have right now I use, I never add new things into the mix, and I'm slowly trying to replace all of the things that I currently have to use that are third party with my own stuff. Uh, with the possible exception of the STB libraries, because like I said, they've been like one of the few things where I've been pretty darn happy uh, about my decision to use them.
What GUI toolkit do you recommend? Uh, I don't know. I don't have very much experience with them. Uh, I do know that uh, uh, one of the guys, I can't remember what, if it, I think it was from Media Molecule maybe, um, recently open sourced an immediate mode graphical user interface library that he said was kind of following the idea that I had put forth for how to do immediate mode graphical user interfaces as a thing. And people seem to really like it. Uh, so, you know, maybe that's good, but I don't have much personal experience with it, so I couldn't say. But people seem to like it. Soy sauce the kid, would clear type quality instead of anti s quality make a difference? Uh, well, clear type quality isn't what we want. That actually plays with the color channels. Um, like, right, uh, clear type is, uh, so, you know, an LCD panel, Um, so, you know, a, an LCD panel, it typically has like a little pixel, right? A pixel element is actually like, looks something like maybe this or something like RGB, where it's actually got like a bar of red, a bar of green and a bar of blue or something. And this is not really right. Like, but there's various ways that this is done, right? So what happens is it means that when you have two pixels together, you actually have some sub pixel precision in the color channels. Meaning if I wanted to render a font that was aligned like this, I could actually make a blue fringe here and then fill the R, G and B here and get a font that was in, that looked like it was positioned at a greater horizontal fidelity than the number of pixels. Like, so in some sense you have three X the resolution, right, horizontally. That's what clear type does. That'd be awful for what we do because remember we're resizing bitmaps and stuff. We don't want any color fringing or those will pop out like a sore thumb. So we really, really, really don't want clear type to happen under any circumstances in our baker. That would be like really, really bad. I guess we're done. I guess that's it for the day, folks. That is it for the day. And you know what? That's it for the week. That's all she wrote. We're off tomorrow and Friday. It's a short week on Handmade Hero. What are you going to do? All right, everyone. Thank you very much for jo joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. Um, Hopefully that uh, gave you some perspective on just how good the STB libraries are. Uh, extracting fonts with Windows looks about like it probably would look using other font libraries as well. Just kind of a mess and tons of function calls and all these other sorts of things, right? Uh, STB libraries, always good. And of course, in this situation also, they're purpose-built for what we need. So that's an even bigger bonus. It means that, you know, uh, we don't have to fuss with, uh, with sort of setting up things like drawing context and stuff, right? So there you go, uh, that's how to do it. So now you know how to extract fonts as well. Uh, and maybe on Monday I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do some, we'll, we'll fix the anti-aliasing so it's kind of done so you can actually switch the paths and, and maybe also the font size thing we can do uh, just so it's, it's pretty symmetric between both paths for anyone who wants to play with either one. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, and like I said, I'm off for the week. Uh, so I will see you guys back here on Monday. Um, hopefully you will all have a great long weekend uh, full of coding fun. I know I have plenty of coding I will be doing this weekend as well. Uh, so until Monday, have fun with that. In the meantime, if you'd like to follow along with the series, uh, source code, you can always pre-order the game at handmadehero.org. It comes with the source code so you can download it every night after I finish coding and play around with it yourself. Uh, we also have a Patreon page if you want to support the video series. We have a forum site where you can get uh, community ports from Mac and Linux, community annotated episode guide, uh, and of course, a, uh, a forum where you can ask questions in case you have questions about the source code. And then we also have a tweet bot tells you when uh, the, the, the show will be live if you're trying to catch it live. And that's pretty handy because uh, especially like with this week where it's a weird schedule, it's just an easy way to kind of know uh, what's going down when the schedule's uh, abnormal. So check that out. 
that's it for me. I will see you guys back here on Monday. Uh, have fun programming, and until Monday, I will see you guys on the internet. Take it easy, everyone.